This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. And this one, it was truly hosted by you because you flew solo in this interview. Yes. So it was with someone who I've known a long time, Jamie Purvis, who is the Executive Vice President of National Accounts for Horizons ETFs, which I think is the fourth largest ETF provider in Canada. Yeah, they said that in the in the interview. So I've known Jamie, it's got to be 20 plus years, which I think he's been with this company, one of his predecessors all the way along. Yeah, it was a fascinating interview. I, we're, we're recording this intro many weeks after I did the interview with, with uh, Jamie. And when I did the interview, it... it it felt like it was overly technical, and I, I thought that we were going to have to do some editing to make it a good listen for our, our podcast audience, but Cameron and I both listened to it, re- re-listened to the interview recently to prepare for our, our intro here, and it's fascinating. It was a bit technical, but technical in a way that I think is going to give people a lot of insight into how mutual funds and, T- and ETFs work in Canada and in the U.S., and also how product manufacturers decide what to bring to market and for what. And he also went a bit down memory road with, you know, talking about the load days, talking about foreign content rules that used to be and how they created synthetic products to get around the foreign content rules. And that's got to be 15 plus years before those rules changed. Yeah, good bit of history on the industry also and the, the structure. some neat nitty gritty things about how the actual ETFs are constructed and how shares are swapped in and out. It was some fascinating stuff, I think, good takeaways and he's very interesting he's very i found it to be an easy listen i agree and just on the on the podcast real quick when this episode comes out our last month for may we, we will have had 15 15 000 downloads which is by far our biggest month since inception so just wanted to say again thank you to all of our, our new listeners we we do really appreciate everyone that's uh, that's tuning in absolutely Jamie, welcome to the Rational Reminder Podcast. Thanks for uh, thanks for being here. Well, thanks for having me, Ben. It's a pleasure. So, Jamie, you're with Horizons, who I'm sure a lot of our listeners are aware of, but can you tell us a little bit about Horizons? Yeah, uh, happily. Yeah, I'm uh, nearing 24 years with Horizons. Huh. I uh, started my career there in Vancouver when it was a retail-based alternative shop. I was the third employee, the first one not named Fred. <laughs> we had $17 million in AUM. About 13 years ago, we made a bit of a strategic pivot when one of our then fund managers, uh, Adam Fileski, came to us with the idea of being the pro funds or pro shares of the North. And so we looked at it, evaluated his business opportunity and launched our first leveraged bull and bear plus mutual funds. And uh, a year and four months after launching those mutual funds, we rolled them into ETFs. We were able to do that and thus began our ETF journey. We now manage $11 billion wow. almost in uh, in ETFs. Of that, only less than $1 billion is in the leveraged product that we originally started with. About 2009, uh, two years after starting that, we, we sort of realized that ETFs are just a super efficient delivery vehicle and decided that we would be well off to concurrently launch two business lines, one that was passive, more traditional uh, goal-oriented ETFs, and then also a lineup of actively managed ETFs. And at this time, our assets, the remaining $10 billion, are split almost 50-50 between active and passive. So uh, that's been that. And six years ago, I think, we sold to a Korean asset manufacturer. So while we're a made in Canada story and a Canadian operation, we are 100% owned by a, a Korean firm called Miri Asset Global Investments. I did not know that. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a success story. The chairman there is a fascinating guy, launched his business 20 years ago, and he still owns the company 100%. They manage $140 billion. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's I had no, I, no idea about that. Yeah, it's very impressive. So when you think about Horizons in the context of the Canadian ETF landscape, like we have iShares and Vanguard battling for the lowest cost total market ETFs. How do you think Horizons fits in to that? Well, going back to our very beginning, we're innovators. The Beta Pro ETFs, were, were the first of their kind in Canada. They're still the only ones, but they're a very different kind of ETF than what had up to that point been traditional ETFs. So we innovated in that sense. And then when we launched the active ETFs, they're the first truly active ETFs in Canada. And when we say active, we mean looking to some degree, but not really like a mutual fund where you have a portfolio manager who has a, a personality or style or what have you that lends them to a field of expertise in a certain segment of the market. Our positioning in the active is the first sort of true active managers in Canada. Now, pretty much everyone's got active. In fact, I think we're hearing that Vanguard, the traditional 
Everyone thinks of Vanguard as a passive shop, but that's what they're known for their for their ETFs. But in truth, they're a monstrous active right. and passive shop. When Vanguard are talking about doing some active work in Canada, I say, okay, the, you know, I think everyone's jumped on board. Uh, BMO are, have active. I mean, pretty much everyone has active. We are the first to, we think, to be really truly active. And our business line reflects that. And we've been active in places where we think indexing is inefficient. Fixed income would be one space, dividends. We're not active in the broad, large cap Canadian equity because it's really hard to create value there, we think. So we've been, we've innovated with the Beta Pro. We innovated with the Active. With our passive lineup, our total return index ETFs, we innovated as well. Because when we looked to enter that market, we said, how do we compete with the iShares of the world? And, the, and you know, at that time, it was just iShares in Canada. Vanguard hadn't come yet. But, you know, the, with the big boys... And we said, can we just compete on fees? Because how how much assets are we going to be able to move by being ten basis points cheaper? If people say we don't, we only know Horizons is a levered ETF shop, not an indexing shop. So in con- consultation with our banking partners, we came out using the TRI structure, which essentially invests in a total return index, meaning the dividends accrue to the NAV to the to the value of the index rather than being paid out, and we use a total return swap to get that. And swap's a word that scares people. And we've taken a long, long educational process to explain to people what those are. But the structure that, that we're using is essentially that that was used, is still used, but not nearly as much right now, by Canada's major public pension plans. If your teachers or OMERS or CPP are the case, you don't want to be managing that stock portfolio. You want to call the bank and say, hey, we'll give you two basis points to give us the return to the TSX 60. From can, now can, until we, we run out. can we back up on this for a second? Yeah. And can can you dig into exactly maybe walk us through how how the swap based structure works for the ETF unit holder? Sure. I'll finish the innovation stuff later. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, the, I mean the structure essentially, well, not essentially, this is what happens. The client, like any mutual fund or ETF, the assets the, the client put go to the custodian. They sit in the custodian. Then you can buy the shares and the shares sit with the custodian. In our case, all the cash sits with the custodian. So CIA, BC Mellon would be our lead there, uh, NBIN as well. And what we do is that cash earns CDOR, which is the rate at which the banks will lend money to each other. It's currently about 2.2%. We enter into a total return swap with our counterparties, which are currently National Bank and or CIBC, depending upon the ETF. The swap part of the transaction is that we're swapping them the returns on the cash, on the client's cash. So 2.2% right now. The counterparty holds the stocks that make up the TSX 60 or whatever the underlying is on our behalf. They're responsible for managing that. The nice thing about a swap is if they were to mess that up, which the banks aren't in the business of messing that up, but if they were to, it doesn't matter. And the line I always use in retail land is, I mean, we care, but we don't really care what they own on the other side of the swap. It could be a giant bag of cookies. Right. They still have to deliver to us exactly the returns of that total return index less fees. So what we've done in, in creating this structure, uh, which we'll get to tax efficiently, but we've also competed on price. So when we launched the TSX 60, we came out at seven basis points. Hmm. The main competitor there is XIU, the oldest ETF in, in the world. Uh, and you know what I used to call Canada's best ETF. I think we, we're better, but that's a like, <laughs> bias. Uh, they were at 15. So when you, when you count at the HST, they're 18 basis points. We were eight and change. That was enough to move the needle. So we instituted fee rebate down to five after a year, and then another year in, we're down to three. Wow. So the cost of of our ETF for you to own the TSX 60 is 3.45 basis points versus 18 for XIU. So 15 basis points, that starts to add up. Anyone can do the math on that. Every year that goes by, that's more savings in your pocket than that. That increases. And in this kind of rate environment, an earnings environment, every penny that you keep is really useful to you. I agree. So- our structure there is that the counterparty owns the stocks for us and delivers the returns. Can you talk a little bit about, so HXT was the one that you were just talking about as a comparison to, to XIC. Can you talk a little bit about how HXT does not have a swap fee, but some of the other ones do? Can you just right. talk about the difference that's going on there? Yeah. So in simplest terms, a Canadian bank gets treated differently on dividends on Canadian equities that they own than a retail client would, a retail investor. They have, whether we want to call it a tax ARB or a different tax treatment, they're able to pass along the benefit, some of the benefit that they make on that difference to us in the form of zero cost swap. Right. As well, because they're Canadian, there's no withholding 
for them to to manage off. Mm. So that gets eliminated. If you look at our international, you can see that our swap fees are clearly are, are mitigating that withholding fees. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Can you talk a little bit about you? You mentioned tax efficiency. So can you just talk a little bit about why this structure can make a lot of sense for people who are taxed at a high rate? Well, sure. I mean, we're all, <laughs> I just shouldn't say we're all taxed at a high rate, but <laughs> those among the listeners fortunate enough to be taxed at a high rate understand that that rate keeps getting higher. Right. And I guess when we talk about saving every penny that you can, that's why people invest in TFSAs. It's why they use registered plans. It's why there's any number of instruments, you know, that you've seen in the past, you've seen flow throughs and all sorts of deals that are designed to save some tax for investing in Canada. So that's a, our structure designed to allow you to, to defer paying tax because you don't get the dividend flow to your portfolio every year, which what do most of your clients do when they get dividends? Reinvest. Reinvest. And then at year end, they pay taxes. Right. So this structure is akin to a registered plan in terms of what it looks like from a client's tax perspective. At the end, they're going to pay their taxes on a larger share, but not pay it year after year after year. So the longer you hold, the better the benefit is. But at the end of the day, the government's still getting uh, their taxes, which they're keen on collecting. Right. Right. So. So uh, one of the things that's happened recently, which makes this conversation very timely, is is that the the federal budget seems to have addressed or, or targeted the swap based ETF total return structure. Can can you just talk a little bit about how Horizons is looking at the potential impact of these? Yeah, let me let me give a little history on on how they sure. do this. And we've often said to their credit, and and it was Finance Minister Flaherty who had this happen twice on his watch. We think back, what do we call it, the Halloween massacre that year when uh, we had the uh, income trusts, mm. which was the, the policy for the income trust was created to allow oil and gas and mining companies to give some sort of tax deduction for the money they were spending on trying to extricate resources, which had a huge benefit to Canada, to the economy. What happened was we had all sorts of other companies start becoming uh, income trusts. And the big one became when BCE said, hey, we may convert to an income trust. And that's when he sort of blew the whistle, said, all right, everybody, out of the pool. <laughs> this is done, right? So that had happened. Then if we look back to 2013, what had happened, Ben, you're, you're much younger than I am. I don't know if you recall, Cam's not here, but uh, uh, he would he would recall this as well. In the old days, our registered plans had foreign content limits. Right. You only hold up to 20% of your portfolio in non-Canadian. But that doesn't do anyone very well in a, in a country that's already got a huge amount of home bias and it's investing. I think this is a, a, a fundamental tenet of your practice. Right. Well, that doesn't do us any good. So what the fund companies of banks and independents alike created were these sort of synthetic structures that allowed you to hold 90% of, the, of your fund holdings were in Canadian cash. And the other 10 cents on the dollar was used to fund a margin account to buy futures that bought the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ or whatever you wanted to have. So you could get your full 100% exposure, but your portfolio still was 90% cash. Right. So that structure was used. And because they were investing in foreign indexes, the CRA essentially allowed that to be taxed as equities rather than as, a, as income, right. which anytime you hold futures, you're viewed as a professional trader and thus all your taxation is income. So there's a, a loophole created there to allow Canadians to get more foreign investment. Well, what happened is, as, as always ha as happens in the financial industry, is that companies twig onto this and start saying, well, we'll have a big holding in cash and we'll buy bond futures. Right. So we'll get bond returns and characterize that as a bigger part in capital gains. Right. So this was, you know, this is a $30 billion business, I want to say. Back in 2013, there's one ETF company at the time it was Claymore. Right. Was doing this. And then all the big mutual fund companies, I think the McKenzie's, uh, independent or other, were using this to essentially recharacterize without there being any instrument for the CRA to get their pound of flesh tax has earned. So Flaherty looked at this and said, okay, 2013, blew the whistle again, told everyone to get out of the pool and said, what we'll do is we'll grandfather your existing forwards. So this was called the 39.4, 39.4 in industry parlance forwards. And those forwards, were, you were writing five-year forwards. So let's say the portfolio was 20% five years from now, 20%, four years from now, 20%. And they just let those expire. So in 2018, the last of those expired. Right. So they didn't do anything punitive. But they they just said, we're not going to be doing this anymore because we're not seeing the benefits of this as a taxing entity. 
So the next thing, when you look at, at what is proposed here, and it's really important to, to note that this is proposed. Right. And our structure will, the total return index structure using the total return swap is fine for 2019. If enacted as proposed, we won't be able to run our structure the same way going forward. That said, this is a very preliminary proposal. I mean, it's right, it's the proposal, but like we've seen in any budget put forward by this government or others, there's a series of other effects that happen and, and there's a there's negotiation say, hey, we, we're targeting this, but what's our spill on effect to other things? Uh, how are we going to implement this? So as it stands, our ETFs will retain their tax efficiency through 2019. What happens beyond then? I mean, we can't, I can't speculate. We don't know where this is going to go. So if we just took a hypothetical and just said that the budget passes as as written for, for this specific mm -hmm. portion, what does that look like? Like no understanding how the, how the structure works currently to be tax efficient. Where does that tax efficiency stop if the budget goes through as proposed? So what they've targeted in this budget is what's called the redeemer's methodology. And without getting into the arcane details of this budget and what happens there, the redeemer's methodology is something that exists in Canada and the US uh, essentially allows the market maker. So when you sell a unit of an ETF, you're not actually the redeemer. You're, it's like a stock. You're just trading. It doesn't disappear. When you sell a unit of your mutual fund, it disappears. Right. I always describe it as this. It's like buying a ball. When I go to a mutual fund and I buy my ball, my unit of mutual fund, they create that ball for me. I use it. And when I'm done with it, I sell it back to them and they destroy it. Right. With an ETF, you get a store that buys a bunch of balls from the factory. We're the factory. The store right. is, uh, we'll say the store is National Bank Financial. They buy a bunch of these balls and then they sell them in the marketplace to the other users. The other users can then sell those balls back and forth and back to National Bank or to the other banks that run market making desks. So that ball can be used many, many, many times by many different investors. But when the market maker, any one of the market makers, which all the Canadian banks essentially have market making operations, when they decide they've got too much inventory, and when, keep in mind when they have that inventory, they're paying fees, right? right. Fees there. They say, we don't want to own this anymore. We'll sell it back to the factory. That's us. Mm. That's when that ball gets destroyed. When anytime there's that, that ball gets destroyed in mutual fund or ETF land, that's when the tax ramifications come on. So when they sell the ball back to us, we say, okay, well, here's the, the part of the swap portfolio that we're giving back to you. And it's, you tell us, you have to tell the government what your tax liability is on that. Right. We're assigning it to you as income. Because they're a pro trader, going back to what we were talking about futures earlier. So everything they do is professional, so it's viewed as income. How that gets taxed seems to be the issue. Huh. So it's not in the ETF structure. It's at the redeemers level, which are the market makers. And the governments, both in Canada and, and the US, have, have allowed the two iterations of the redeemers methodology to exist to allow facilitation of the buying and selling of shares in a tax efficient manner. Because what you're doing is turning over the example I've read lately is in the States. If you're redeeming units of a an ETF that owns a ton of Facebook and has forever, what they're giving back to you are the stocks, right? the Facebook stocks. Well, those Facebook stocks have appreciated significantly. So they allow them to write that off so that all the transaction in Facebook doesn't affect the cost. Right. So the market maker is able to hold it and use it again. So this, this, this wouldn't just affect swap-based ETFs. It would be pretty sweeping. Yeah, it, it's certainly... Well, it looks to be targeted at swap-based ETFs, the reality is that this Redeemer's methodology is used by all ETFs and by mutual funds in wow. Canada. So that's what I was referring to earlier when I say that you're potentially targeting A, like swap-based ETFs, because they're not getting their pound of flesh from the Redeemer's as they'd like. But it's affecting all the other ETFs because what this would essentially mean is that we as ETF providers would need to know every individual's holdings and ETFs. And that's one of the reasons ETFs are so cheap is because we don't know who our clients are. Right. You tell us, you might tell us how much you hold of our ETFs, but we don't know who all the individual clients are. Right. And so we'd need to know that to calculate their adjusted cost bases to then issue them essentially T4s or whatever the appropriate tax forms would be. But it doesn't allow for the differentiation of what the type of account is. Huh. So there's all sorts of complications as well. If you're issuing that at year end, what happens for investor A who owns the ETF from January to November and sells and investor B who owns the, buys the ETF in October and owns it at year end. It would seem that investor B is assuming the tax liability of investor A because they got out before year end. Right. And this is a historical issue 
uh, to some degree in mutual fund land, right? You've right. got residual tax issuance. That's the guys left holding the bag at the end of the year. So there are, it would appear, you know, upon talking to many other industry participants, there's some inefficiencies in the budget as proposed. What happens with it? I, I can't speculate, but we've seen historically this government and previous governments issue a proposed budget and then figure out what's actually rational right. and walk it back a couple steps to say, how do we do what's best for Canadians? Target what we think is this issue without affecting other Canadians adversely or affecting the Canadian marketplace. Because this is, the government's very keen on protecting the middle class and growing the middle class. The middle class is exactly who is saying, yeah, we'll buy ETFs because they're cost efficient. Right. So there's still work to be done. What this market looks like in January of 2020, I don't know. Right. So you guys must be getting a ton of questions. What, what are you telling your, your clients about, about this? Well, our positioning for the clients is all that we know right now is that this proposed budget, if enacted as proposed, means that our TRI ETFs lose their tax efficiency in 2020 and beyond. Okay. How the budget ends up looking sure. is a difference. What does that mean for us as an ETF company? Well, if this structure doesn't work, do we close the ETFs? Do we restructure them? And I think you and I could have a conversation where we come up with many, many alternatives. Right. And I think it's safe to say that we're working on a variety of alternatives. The simplest one that people think of is what if you just went to be a physical ETF and compete on cost? Which keeping in mind on our Canadian ETFs, we're already cost competitive. Right. You know, I talked about HXT being three basis points, 3.45 versus 18. But if you look at energy and financials, we're on an MER, not management fees of 29 basis points versus 61 versus the iShares competitors. Wow. We recently launched three ETFs and recently, I mean, in Q1, six weeks before this budget came out on equal weight banks, huh. laddered preferred shares and Canadian REITs. All of those are priced about 10 points cheaper than their competitors at another dealer that use the exact same indexes. Do your costs go up though, if you can't implement the same way? Well, all of our costs will go up. Right. All ETF company costs will go up. Yeah. And then it's a matter of, do we go even, you're never supposed to call your own products cheap. Right. More cost efficient. Right. <laughs> Whatever we want to look at. That's just one possible solution. Is there another structure out there? What if the CRA come back and say our budget allows you to run TRI for equities, but not for fixed income? Oh, interesting. There's so many different variables that we could be working on 20 different solutions right now. What we're telling our clients is this is what we know is that 2019, everything is status quo. 2020, if enacted, we will not be able to run this structure anymore. We'll know a lot more. In of September. course, yeah, yeah. We'll know more before September. The vote to ratify this or to enact it, I beg your pardon, is in September, uh, typically. So we'll know before then. And we are being very proactive in telling our clients, educating them. We, I mean, we sure. press release the day after this budget came out. We think we have a fiduciary, ethical, and moral responsibility to keep our clients informed. And we'll be doing the same thing as to future options. It is, it's an unknown. What we are suggesting to our clients and what has been almost universal uptake has been, no one has enough information yet. Right. So we want you, you want yourself to make an informed decision, make the informed decision when you have the appropriate information. Of course. And we'll be sharing that with you. So we've just gone down the path of talking about the recent, the budget, which, which I would classify in terms of risks specific to the swap-based structure as legislative risk. Mm -hmm. Now, other than that, if we compare just a regular long-only ETF to the swap-based structure, what are some of the other risks that people should be aware of specific to the structure? Well, the other risk and the one that we dealt with primarily for years before we we ended up talking about the regulatory risk was the counterparty risk. So, Ben, you're old enough to remember Nortel. You're, not, you're in Ottawa. You've got to have a Nortel experience. There was a Nortel effect. You remember Nortel became 44% of the TSX. So they instituted rules after that that capped your exposure to any one issuance mm. at 10%. Right. So keep in mind that I th think we talked about this already. ETFs are legally mutual funds. We right. follow national instrument 81102. We just trade differently, essentially. Right. So what that means is for that swap, we've got, I talked about that basket where we hold the clients $100 and we enter into the swap and we pay away CDOR and they give the swap. Right. Our exposure to the counterparty is however much the ETF has gone up. So you can only have 10% exposure to any asset besides cash. So if 
we had a hundred dollars in or a million dollars in this, let's say, in the TSX sixty, and it went up ten percent, and our swap counterparty was National Bank, we would then be at ten percent exposure. So all the gains would be exposed to National Bank. Right. That's assuming that there's no further subscriptions, right? Because any other subscriptions would bring that number down because if we took another $100 million and all of a sudden we'd be 5% exposed. Right. Mark to market. So that's one. Anyways, once that happens, we have 45 days to rectify the situation. And that can mean that the market drops, Mm. which means that then all of a sudden we're down 10%, below 10% exposure to the counterparty. Or we get another subscription. So our asset base grows, but the total gains is, you know, we made 10 million, but now we've got 200 million. So it's only 5% uh, mark to market exposure, or we get redemptions. And this is what's really been key in the TRI structure is that when we get a redemption, we're able to pick which swaps in our basket. So we don't just have one swap exposure to that. We have a basket of swaps. Okay. And let's say the market's just gone straight up for that 10%. We would be taking the original swaps that we wrote because they have the highest mark to market exposure and redeeming those to the counterparty, to National Bank. Right. The counterparty then would treat those gains as income and they would redeem them. Right. So what that means is we've removed a section of the swaps with the highest mark-to-market exposure and that naturally brings down our mark-to-market exposure to the, right. to the counterparty. So for example, the TSX60, which we launched, HXT, we launched on uh, September 15th, 2010. Since then, the TSX60 is up about 63%. Our current counterparty exposure is 1.5%. Huh. So by virtue of the ETF growing and there being continuous redemptions, we've been able to whittle down or to make, I wouldn't say whittle down, but to keep the mark to market exposure low. So we're not at the 10% exposure, even though the, the ETF is actually up 60 plus percent. Right. So we're not there, but the risk is still, let's say that we were 10% exposed to national bank. And before we could deal with it, before we took any other subscriptions, our risk is that national bank goes under. Right. So you have to ask yourself, what's the situation where the market's up and one of the major Canadian banks is going under? Sure. Or both of them. Because keep in mind, sorry, here's another method that we can deal with that mark-to-market exposure. We add counterparties. Mm. If we had CIBC, so let's say national banks at 10%, we add CIBC, they take on 5% of that, you've got additional. So now you've got buffer on both. So you're looking at a situation where you've got one counterparty, like here's the worst case scenario. You've got one counterparty, the market goes up 10%. You don't have any subscriptions or redemptions in the interim. And then they go under while the market's up. Right. It's not impossible. Right. But you have to say, what's the probability of this being a realistic risk assessment? And I think that you can look at our track record of where the counterparty exposure sits. We have ETFs that have made money over time. There were the index is up and the counterparty exposure is negative. Interesting. That's the important part about what we do in this process of keeping down that counterparty risk. We thought dealing with the regulatory risk as well, because when you're assigning away all that mark to market exposure, those positive gains, that's taxable to the CRA. That bit is where the Redeemer's methodology is being looked at right now. Huh. So I'm sorry, it's a very complex uh, sort of operational things about an ETF, but this is really oh, where, where the value has been provided historically. It's really interesting. If we make the assumption that the structure is going to continue being taxed as it is now, so say no legislative changes, do you think that there are any situations where the swap-based st- structure does not make sense? Like I'm thinking about uh, you know, the, the international and US swap ETFs do have a swap fee in mm-hmm. addition to the MER. Are, are there any cases where it doesn't make sense to be paying that additional cost? Yeah, typically you, in registered plans. Right. That would be the big one. Or this is, And this is true for all ETFs really where you're making regular contributions. This is where the efficiency of mutual funds is, is that really your cost of transacting mutual funds is buried within the mutual fund value itself, whereas your cost of transacting ETFs is on top of. Right. And you think about what Canadians don't like, they don't like paying additional fees. Right. That's why, you know, think about DSC mutual funds being so popular for years. Right. We now know that they're really not beneficial clients. <laughs> yeah. But think about the GST or now the HST, right? It replaced a manufacturer's tax years ago. And I... Sorry, I have some of this ridiculous knowledge. My father was an economist and actually used to sit in the in the quiet room for the budget so that huh. he'd, he'd read the budget and write about it. So when it came out, he was writing one of these reports. That's one of the things I learned from him is that the manufacturer's tax was higher than the GST. Huh. But by removing it from being a hidden tax and causing it to be an additive tax, Canadians went crazy. Interesting. Now, that's part of that's the Canadian psyche. 
And part of it's probably because retail said, oh, well, we're not going to drop the price as much. We're going to add a little couple percent of profit line, right? There's, a, there's always operational issues, but Canadians are uh, opposed to paying additional fees. So that's, but in one of the places, smaller accounts with recurring investments and registered plans would really be the two where the tax efficient structure doesn't make sense. Or maybe if you've got a very low taxable income, even in a taxable yeah. account. Yeah. I don't know who's got low taxable income and lots of cash. Yeah, lots of investing investing so. outside registered plans <laughs> and a low income. I agree. Right. Uh, unlikely. So one of the other things that Horizon has done quite a lot of, uh, other than the total return, is doing some thematic ETFs. Like I know HMMJ has definitely been a big one with the whole cannabis craze that's been happening. How do you guys think about which thematic ETFs you should create? Yeah, well, and I don't have any samples of HMMJ, just in case people are asking out there. Whether that's not what we're in the business, although the first first physical dispensary opened today. Yeah. Right, so I, I do think there's some humor to be found as well. That it's the Ontario Cannabis Store. It's, OCS is not much different from the OSC. <laughs> it's just flipping around. But the, certainly thematically, and you know, I, I think we would admit to being very lucky and capturing some lightning in a bottle with our marijuana ETF. And certainly we're on record saying this at the beginning is that, look, it's – not a hugely liquid market. It's probably the sort of the ugliest ETF we ever launched. When we launched it two years ago this Thursday, there were 13 names in the wow. index. One of them was Scott's miracle Grow, which, you know, allocates 5 to 10% of their business to medical marijuana, to growing it. And, but it was a huge factor for liquidity. And now at the most recent rebalance earlier this month, we're at, I think, 59 names. Wow. So it speaks to the growth of that industry that this has happened and the Canadian appetite for it and the Canada being the ideal place for it to be distributed if you look at a lot of the constituents, they're companies with operations in Colombia or the US or right. Australia, but they list in Canada because the, the Canadian market is so favorable to, to listing. But we launched that two years ago and it's been over and be below a billion dollars for the better part of a year now. Okay. Wow. Um, we had an in, uh, in-house in office pool. That's where we thought it'd be at year end. And I think of the first year we were out and I came second, I think I said $220 million. Okay. I think the winner said 300 something and it ended up being 860 at the end wow. of the first year. So we certainly caught lightning in a bottle and I wouldn't say that we weren't thoughtful about it, but we were early. And this is part of our history of innovation is that we're willing to take a little bit of risk here and kudos to our CEO, Steve Hawkins on this, who's become a real champion of marijuana businesses in Canada, but not just in Canada and abroad. I mean, he was on Bloomberg last week. We we're in the economist, hmm. things like that. We're not, that's not what we were planning, but we did see that we thought marijuana, even just from a medical perspective, had long-term mainstream usage. And, you know, I did some investor seminars, like the day before it actually launched, I was doing one to a bunch of 70 plus septuagenarians. Okay. And they asked me about the, about the product. I wasn't there to talk about it, but they asked me and I started, I explained it. And there was one, forgive the term, little old lady who was, all the other guys were like, oh, my wife uses a topical cream for arthritis. My buddy uses it to ease the pain of his cancer. Right. I take the pills for my cataract surgery. Like, so there was this huge underground swelling of favorable right. thought on medical marijuana that we hadn't really tapped into. We thought we didn't think it was that big. And then of course, when legalization and re recreational came about, that really opened up those markets. So we were innovative, but we were lucky. But we always thought that there was long-term growth and the idea would be that we're investing in a theme that while not mainstream yet, was going to be someday down the road, be it five years or 15 years. So some of the, in some cases, we want to be ahead of the curve. You think about what we've done in the last couple of years as well. We launched, uh, uh, we got an ET, ETF called uh, Arbot, which is robotics and automation. Hmm. And that, again, think about medical practices. You got to have eye surgery. And the two specialists in town, one of them 65 years old, he's been doing it for 35 years. He knows everything. But... I mean, I'm not 65 and I'm already, you know, my hands aren't <laughs> as precise as I want them to be. And if someone's cutting in my eye, I want that precision. Right. The other guy's a 30-year-old hotshot who's got steady hands, but not the experience. So if you look at what's happening in modern hospitals now, surgical procedures, there's typically, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a surgeon. She said she's got two robots in every surgery with her. Hmm. So for micromillimeter precision, they use the robot. So th this is the future, the development of this. We're not talking about fridges that tell you when you're out of milk. Or we're talking about mainstream use. And so things like robotics and automation. And then as an offshoot to that, we launched an ETF called FOUR, F-O-U-R, which stands for Industry 4.0, which is robotics and automation, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, uh, cloud computing. 
So that it's all about things that are becoming mainstream now, but we don't recognize. Mm. And people look at the names, they say, well, I don't, that's not Sony. That's not Wells Fargo. That's not Goldman Sachs. But they're companies that, like NVIDIA that are growing like crazy and are, are involved in everyday part of our life. And they're just getting going. So robotics, the other one would be blockchain. You know, and we're not investing in companies that we think will benefit from blockchain. We're be- investing in the software and hardware companies that are part of blockchain. People always say blockchain is, oh, you must be into cryptocurrencies. Well, no, cryptocurrencies need blockchain. Blockchain doesn't need cryptocurrencies. So in each of these examples, we're t- taking a mindset on things that are, we think, become members of the TSX 60 or the S&P 500 someday down the road. Uh, you know, and I think it'd be a fascinating day in the press when Canopy or Afria or one of these guys goes into the TSX 60. True. Like there's just so much going on in the future. And you and I sort of talked about this a little bit before. We don't know who's going to survive, but we didn't know who was going to survive in the internet boom. Right. They didn't know who was going to survive in the automobile industry in the turn of the last century when there are 100 plus US auto manufacturers. So we want to own the index for these things. Acknowledge that not everything's going to survive, but not take the risk of doing individual stock selection in a market that we can't predict what's going to happen. Right. So that makes me think of an interesting question. And I know you you mentioned this when we were chatting before as well, that Horizons has closed down a lot of products too. So that what you just said makes me think of, uh, well, reminds me to ask that question, I guess. If we think about, say, HMMJ, say, like you said, there is consolidation and a lot of the companies don't do well. And over the all, the, in, the index as a whole doesn't do well. At, at what point do you close down a product? What does that thought process look like? Well, the, I think you look at it for two things, right? One from a selfish corporate perspective is, is, is it profitable? I think we've shown historically the willingness to carry lost leaders for longer than most because we believe in the idea. But we also look at say, does it hold the client interest? Like I think about some of the things we've closed. When we launched our active ETF business back in 2008, we had a value and a growth and a dividend ETF, and they were all designed to look like their mutual fund counterparts, just cheaper. Right. We realized that the methodology didn't work. It didn't attract clients. I didn't care. We, we tried three different times with balanced ETFs or two or three times with balanced ETFs hmm. before finally hitting on what we've done now with our portfolios of our own ETFs, just like we've seen Vanguard and iShares and BMO. Yeah. Do it. You know, it's no coincidence that the four largest ETF companies in Canada have all sort of come to this right. point at the same time where we've realized what the ideal structure of this is going to look like. But, you know, I think about our younger days. We launched some things where we didn't have as much market information. We didn't have as much maturity or rigor in our own process. <clears throat> but because the Beta Pro ETFs were really successful early, right, and they're very profitable ETFs, we had money that we could try things out. So while I think that we've carried on the spirit of innovation from our early days, our experience has made us better at selecting what to actually go forward with and what not to. And I guess that helps you know how long you can keep something too. Right. That's right. interesting. There was one, I, I don't know if you remember this, and I, 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 uh, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you about this, but there, there was one product that I looked at a while ago. It was a managed futures ETF. Yeah. And managed futures, the data around that is, is pretty good. And there's been a, a bit of a, a resurgence, I think, in, in the sort of quant ETF approach. And you guys were early to that, but it closed down. Why did it close down? Well, it's, it speaks to our history at Horizons. Like I talked about being the third guy, and that's what we did. We're managed futures and fund of funds. And funny, We've been in a quantitative easing environment for 10 years. Mm. Managed futures really show their value when markets correct, when things zig and they zag. Right. Without a zigging, there's no zagging. So they just weren't going anywhere. And as such, they weren't compelling. Huh. As, uh, academically, I believe in them hugely. It makes sense. If you put up an efficient frontier and you put a 20% allocation of managed futures, historically, it does wonders for your portfolio. Unfortunately, our historically, while we had that product going, was not one that was conducive to owning anything non-correlated, not negatively correlated, but non-correlated. Exactly, yeah. Because equities of, you know, our bond bull market maybe is at, a, at an end, but I mean, we're seeing rates back down a little bit right now, you know, which is good news for everyone with a floating rate mortgage and not going to be punitive to bondholders right now. But there's been no, there's been no impetus to own alternatives. You look at the Canadian Hedge Fund Association, like the industry itself, they're having a hard time. There's great products out there. There's really good ideas, but the market's not cooperating. Right. Yeah, that's kind of what I figured because uh, like you said, the the performance wasn't very good while the product was open for this managed managed futures ETF, but the idea is a pretty good one. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it 
caused our most forward thinking advisors who are in this when we called them and said, look, we, we're going to close this because it's not profitable. It hasn't been profitable forever. hasn't delivered any returns. We just can't keep it going. Right. And they're like, well, there's nowhere else for me to go. Right. Uh, I'm sorry, but as much as we'd love to serve you guys, we don't have an offset to it. Yeah. It's not like our beta pro ETS where all the money can be in the bear plus and very little in the bull plus, but we look at them as a pair. We didn't have anything we could pair against that to say, how long can we keep this going? Right. All ETF companies want to get out of seed company, seed capital when they launch something. And that generally gets them to close to their level of profitability. Because once you're out of seed capital, all the money that's in seed capital. So when you launch an ETF, someone gives you money to launch it. Right. Let's say you put $10 million in it. But if you, the seeding companies put in 10 million and you've only sold 9 million, they're still sitting in seed. So you're actually not making money on the, on the million still. Right. Once you get through that, it starts being additive and that's where you start actually being profitable or, or breaking even. And so that's really what we're looking at. Most ETFs depends on the manufacturer and the pricing need 12 to $25 million to be profitable. Interesting. So that's where everyone's making their decisions. And it's for startups now, it's difficult. How long can we keep going with this? That not being profitable, how deep pocket are our investors and our backers? Right. And so it's why I think, you know, the top four ETF companies in the country, of which we're number four, are 88% of the market. Wow. And we're all relatively robust businesses. Right. There's a lot of other ETF companies that are now launched by mutual fund companies and banks that are coming up. So they've got reserves to build it, but the independent guys are in for a, a tough go just because of the economics of launch. It's right. sorry, the economics of launch are cheap. <clears throat> the economics of operation are difficult for a point. You and margins at, are tight, right? Margins I imagine. Are, yeah. Yeah. Well, you're talking to a guy with a three basis point ETF, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. Cool. Well, I don't have any uh I don't have any, any other questions, Jamie. Is there anything else that you uh you want to add? No, I don't I don't think so. I, I've been just going back to you talk about the thematic. That would be the last part of an era of our innovation. You look at us as, from our leverage ETFs to the first being sort of true active to where we're passive, trying to offer some value to, to clients through doing the thing the slightly different way to the thematic now. The other thing that we've done, not just thematic, is partnered with some firms that do very specific ideas. So we're partnered with Four Strong and they do a global macro ETF of ETFs. Or uh We've got a risk parity ETF. Okay. Um, so there's all sorts of, there are some interesting side projects that we have going, but really our core business is the active and passive. And you know, we're excited to see where things go and keen to see some resolution to this budgetary issue. Yeah, I think a lot of people, uh, yeah. especially your clients, are, are looking f- forward to that resolution. Well, right. The ones who've, who have taken the leap to date to, right. you know, to put $4 billion into this, Yeah, uh, they've bought into the structure. They love it. Right. They see the benefits. They can actually calculate the benefit to the oh, penny. Yeah. Yep. So being able to do that and having that, you know, for especially for private corps, things yep. like that. There's, there's all sorts of value in what we do that we offer to Canadians. And we hopefully we get some positive resolution on the, on the matter with the with the budget going forward. Right. All right. Well, thanks again for, for being on the podcast today, Jamie. Well, thanks for having me, Ben. It's been great. All right. Cheers.